America Looks Abroad. This is the 47th in a series of broadcasts presented by the staff members of the Foreign Policy Association, a nonpartisan organization which offers accurate information on world affairs. Today's subject is Washington Answers the Axis Powers. Mr. William T. Stone, Vice President of the Foreign Policy Association and Director of its Washington Bureau, will speak to you from the nation's capital. Mr. Stone. Good afternoon. Events which mark decisive turning points in history sometimes pass unnoticed at the time they occur. With our attention divided between an election campaign at home and war headlines from abroad, many Americans have failed to note the sequence of diplomatic events which has followed the alliance between Germany, Italy, and Japan. Yet these events may ultimately fall in the category of decisive turning points. During the past two weeks, diplomatic activity has centered on the Far East. Ten days ago, our State Department instructed United States consuls in China, Japan, and other parts of Asia to advise American citizens in these areas to return to the United States as soon as possible. Three American ships have been ordered to Far Eastern ports to evacuate American nationals. On Thursday of this week, the United States applied a sweeping embargo on iron and steel scrap, which applies to all countries outside the Western Hemisphere, except Great Britain. On Friday, Great Britain reopened the Burma Road, which runs from La Xio on the northern border of Burma to Kunming in Yunnan province. And thousands of American-made trucks began to carry new war materials to the armies of Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek in China. None of these steps was publicly announced as a reply to the Axis alliance. Only the only public reply from the United States was President Roosevelt's speech at Dayton a week ago. That speech, you recall, was addressed to the nations of the Western Hemisphere and called for a program of total defense for the New World. But it also carried a blunt warning to the Axis powers. Two passages in particular were directed overseas. In one, the president flatly rejected the doctrine of appeasement and declared that no combination of dictator countries in Europe or Asia will stop the help that we are giving to almost the last free people now holding them at bay. In the second passage, President Roosevelt declared that when we speak of defending the Western Hemisphere, we include the right to the peaceful use of the Atlantic Ocean and of the Pacific Ocean. Now, in reading this final passage, many diplomats in Washington and perhaps elsewhere asked a significant question. Did the president mean that the United States was determined to keep war away from the New World by building a defense so strong as to guarantee access to both the Atlantic and the Pacific in any possible contingency? Or did he mean something more than a system of hemisphere defense? backed by a two-ocean navy and an air force second to none. Was he proposing another doctrine, based on the old principle of military strategy that the offense is the best possible defense? Did he mean, in other words, that the United States was preparing to take the offensive itself? <clears throat> Plausible arguments may be advanced to support either of these interpretations. For example... If Hitler was the real leader in bringing Japan into the Axis alliance, his deliberate purpose may have been to involve the United States in war with Japan, to immobilize our fleet in the Pacific, and to leave the European Axis partners free to deal with Great Britain. Those who believe that this was Hitler's real purpose assert that it would be fatal for the United States to fall into the trap. While we could undoubtedly defeat Japan in a final showdown, we might find ourselves involved in a long and costly war in the Western Pacific, thousands of miles from our own home bases, and at a time when the major threat to our interests lay across the Atlantic. Aid to Great Britain in Europe, they say, is vital to the defense of the Western Hemisphere, as a German victory there would expose us to grave dangers in Latin America. On the other hand, many believe that the Triple Alliance was actually a gigantic bluff to frighten the United States by the threat, the empty threat, of action in both oceans. 
those who accept this interpretation, argue that the United States must not only be prepared to take a firm stand in the Pacific, but that the most effective answer to the Axis would be to adopt an offensive strategy ourselves. The adoption of an offensive strategy, they admit, involves risks, but so, they insist, does a policy of inaction. Naval experts and students of foreign policy have long recognized that the key to all offensive action in the Far East, whether diplomatic or economic or strategic, is found in the relations between the United States and Great Britain, with the Soviet Union as perhaps an uncertain third factor. Acting alone or at cross-purposes, neither Great Britain nor America is in a position to enforce any positive policy, as the history of recent years demonstrates only too well. In analyzing the present situation in the Far East, therefore, it is important to examine particularly the relations between these three powers. The reopening of the Burma Road was described in Washington this week as a British move, taken independently of the United States. Three months ago, however, when Britain agreed to close the Burma route under heavy pressure from Japan, the United States was admittedly a factor in British calculations. At that time, not perhaps entirely without reason, London seemed doubtful of American support in case of a showdown with Japan. Then, as now, the American fleet was based in the Pacific. But immediately after the collapse of France in June, fears of a possible German victory in Europe held Washington's eyes on the Atlantic. And Great Britain, without what she regarded as full assurance of American support, fell back on her oldest principle of empire defense, which is never to become involved simultaneously in her three vital areas, the Atlantic, the Mediterranean, and the Far East. The decision last week to reopen the Burma Road, which has become a symbol of aid to China, is accepted as tacit evidence, at any rate, of a new willingness in Washington to take the lead. There have been other indications of parallel action between the United States and the British Empire. On the same day that the State Department advised American citizens to return from the Far East, for example, the Canadian government imposed an embargo on the export of copper to Japan. On the same day, the Department of Agriculture in Washington announced that export bounties or subsidies would be discontinued at once on all shipments of wheat and flour consigned to China and Hong Kong presumably because such shipments had been reaching Japanese armies in China. Two days later, President Roosevelt signed an important act, granting him authority to requisition war materials, including airplanes and machine tools needed for our own national defense. This authority was promptly used by American officials in the Philippines to recapture a shipment of military airplanes on their way to Siam. At the same time, in London, the British Undersecretary for Foreign Affairs, Mr. Richard Butler, in answer to questions in the House of Commons, told the House that matters of considerable importance had been canvassed in certain talks touching cooperation in the Pacific. Presumably, these talks referred to the recent conversations between Lord Lothian, the British ambassador in Washington, Mr. Richard Casey, the Australian minister, and our own State Department officials. While no decisions have been announced, speculation has centered on the possibility of a naval base agreement in the Pacific, under which the United States would have access to the great Singapore naval base and other harbors in the East Indies in, and Australia. In other words, if Britain and the United States are really determined to take the initiative in the Far East, they must be prepared to back up their economic and diplomatic moves by concerted fleet action. It is well recognized that owing to its lack of impregnable bases in the Far East, the United States could not carry on single-handed operations in the Western Pacific. In this connection, it's interesting to recall the testimony of Admiral J.K. Tausig before the Naval, the Senate Naval Affairs Committee last spring. Admiral Tausig declared at that time that if the Navy 
did have access to the harbors and inland waters of Great Britain and the Dutch East Indies, it would be in a position, in his opinion, to undertake successful naval operations against Japan in that area. This view was never officially supported by the naval, Navy Department, but it seems to be shared by perhaps a majority of the naval experts in Washington. For the moment, the parallel steps taken by Washington and London have had a sobering effect in Tokyo. The restrained comments of Japanese officials have been in marked contrast to the belligerent threats which were uttered immediately after the announcement of the Axis alignment. But despite softer words, Japan's allegiance to the Axis was affirmed by Foreign Minister Matsuoka the day after President Roosevelt's Dayton speech, and there is no sign of a Japanese backdown. In Washington, the sec one section of opinion is still counseling a go-slow policy, but the response in Japan has apparently strengthened the policy of firmness. This does not necessarily mean that a final showdown is at hand. Japan has not yet resorted to direct reprisals and may well hesitate to risk an act of war. At the same time, neither Britain nor the United States has yet imposed a general embargo on all war materials to Japan, or even oil and gasoline. The United States has barred export of high-test aviation gasoline and... Uh, Reports from London today hint that Britain is planning to buy up the entire production of aviation gas from the Dutch East Indies. At the same time, it is denied that the private oil companies in the Netherlands Indies, the Royal Dutch Shell and a subsidiary of Standard Vacuum Company in New York, have agreed to supply 40% of Japan's needs for the next six months, as reported earlier this week. Nevertheless, Japan is still continuing her negotiations. Another puzzling news item came from Hong Kong only yesterday in the form of a report that Great Britain had agreed not to resume shipments from Hong Kong to nationalist China. If true, this would seem to indicate that there may still be definite limits to British resistance in the Far East. The third factor, the Soviet Union, again entered the picture last week with the continuation of talks between Under Secretary of State Sumner Wells and Konstantin Umansky, the Soviet ambassador to Washington. Here the approach was somewhat cautious and the results apparently meager. Two minor results were allowed to become known. First, it was revealed that the United States Maritime Commission had permitted Russia to charter a number of American tankers, while such charters had not been granted to the Japanese. Second, it was revealed that export licenses had been granted for the shipment to Russia of about $7 million worth of machine tools ordered by the Soviet Union months ago, but held on the docks of American ports since last August. But so far, these concessions have failed to bring about an understanding which assures that Russia will not make a deal with the Axis powers. Stalin may not like the advance of Nazi troops into Romania and Hitler's threat to seize control of the Dardanelles, which Russia has always regarded as vital to her own security. But like many smaller countries, Russia may have to yield to her powerful neighbors in Europe or come to terms with Japan in the Far East. The United States cannot afford to ignore these possibilities in weighing its policy of parallel action with Great Britain in the Far East. Mr. William T. Stone, Vice President of the Foreign Policy Association and Director of its Washington Bureau, was today's speaker in the America Looks Abroad series. If you would like a free copy of this talk, address your request to the Foreign Policy Association, 22 East 38th Street, or in care of the station to which you are now listening. The Foreign Policy Association is a nonpartisan organization open to all who are interested in American foreign policy. It offers accurate information on current world happenings. In the world of today, foreign affairs are your affairs. We invite you to tune in next Sunday to hear another speaker in the America Looks Abroad series. This is the National Broadcasting Company.